Hello and welcome to the healthcare webinar, Increasing Efficiency in Healthcare Administration. In collaboration with Ebo and with myself, the host, Dr. Sam Adishay for Centric Health Media. The cost of a lost appointment is probably around £150. So the context, Doug, that you asked me to start with is this. We're looking at a whopping, you know, half a trillion pounds in possibly lost clinical time and around 20 million time appointments which need to be scheduled account across the country. And this is not an insignificant challenge here, right? We have a growing backlog of electives to clear. We have patients whose condition is just getting worse as their appointments are delayed. And we have people in the community who can't even get their first appointment or have avoided coming in for fear of infection. So they can't get diagnosed, they can't get the early treatment. COVID has accelerated our adoption of like virtual appointments and remote patient monitoring. So there is some efficiency gained there. When you look at the impact now that Jenny's just talked about of COVID and, and the backlog we've now got to deal with and, and the, the uh, economical impact COVID has had on society, it's absolutely imperative now that we maximise the appointments that we've got and make sure that the patients are there at the right time. And patients being able to communicate conveniently and easily through, through this sort of technology so that if they can't make the appointment, they can reschedule and we can reuse the appointments in, in an appropriate way is, is absolutely imperative. And, and the patients are, are keen to do it as well as, as the statistics show. Well, I'll say this, Doug, our virtual agents our AI artifacts are indistinguishable from human agents because they constantly learn to improve their cognitive abilities and they do so accurately and they do so efficiently. We're really not just trying to redefine the way hospitals operate, but we're trying to redefine the value which they give to their patients. And this really is the next paradigm shift. It's layering artificial intelligence on top of PASS and EPR systems, on top of medical records, to make sure that we reach the next level of digital transformation and that we provide the decision-making support and the real tools for automation. Is it f fair to say that there's some people out there who will be thinking that all of this technology will mean the demise of the workforce? And what will we do with all the staff that we have I'll start off then in the case then, Douglas. I mean, in my career in tech, and especially more so in the context of AI, I mean, this question always comes up. Are we going to lose people? Am I going to lose my job as a part, part of it? I mean, people fear being replaced by robots. You Google, there are many articles that spread this doom and gloom message about the rise of the robots. But if you think about your own circle of people you know, how many people have really lost their jobs as a direct result of AI? So, and I'll use take a word that actually JJ used previously, it's about the word augment, and it's not replace. There's this quote I, I really like from Curtis Langlaus, and he's a professor of radiology at Stanford. He said, AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. You know, AI definitely offers a lot of quick wins. And especially with something uh, in relation to administrative, you're, you're looking at something which really helps medical staff to focus on the high stake and low frequency situations rather than staying stuck, you know, on the repetitive tasks. So if you take, if you balance everything, it's a win-win situation. And especially if it is implemented in a phased manner, remember that we're looking at behavioral change. I think the first one is we always register a significant retained reduction in DNAs and what we call CNAs or cannot attend. I think that's very, very clear. And we uh, reduce that within usually about one month from being onboarded. Secondly, we see a better level of utilization in terms of efficiency and quality of clinical time because you are releasing uh, those empty slots, those useless slots, those time-wasting events which prevent the duty of care to be given to now be refocused. And the third one certainly would be an immediate cost reduction when it comes to postage and SMS delivery charges um, relating to reminders. So the moment a patient can have a conversation 
with a hospital, a meaningful conversation, an intelligent conversation, a wide conversation, you immediately see these three results coming in. A year ago, we would do all of our meetings with customs over a Teams video link. It was, un, it was unheard of before. So when we look at this sort of technology and deploying it, it's important we consider the much larger project we're trying to do here. This is not a technology project. This is a benefit driven project we're trying to deliver for the organization. So it's much broader than putting the technology in. It's more of about a marketing and communication uh, project that we're, we're delivering so that our patients know about this technology and know how they can go about engaging with it. The, um, the pressure should also come from newly qualified healthcare professionals to put pressure on the incumbent um, ways of working to change because they're coming with a higher degree of expectations. And so it's up to the health organizations to honor that and advance the acceleration of, of the right technology to deliver care. Um, it, 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 it's lovely that Steve touched on adoption and he's so right in mentioning this point. But the interesting thing is that it's almost like healthcare is now um, adapting to the culture which has been set already. I mean, in messaging is 26 years old. You know, just it's just ubiquitous, like the internet, right? So 97% of all smartphone users in the UK have sent a message in the last week, right? WhatsApp and Facebook are used by more than 80% of the population. So I think almost what we're saying is we don't need to retrain the public, but we really need to retrain the institutions for them to understand the new cultural realities and expectations that citizens have of them. In order to get people to trust AI, I think the very first step is to explain it to them, to explain the process behind it. How did the AI come to the, for example, to the conclusion that uh, there was an appointment, for example, that wasn't scheduled at the, at the right time or that it needs to be rescheduled? So how did it come to understand? And explaining AI, and that also comes as well with making sure that there is digital health for all. So having also society-based program to teach people about AI as well. We have to remind people that AI won't replace, but rather empower people. Imagine having 10 clerks helping you with that particular appointment rather than one clerk to one human. Excellent. And that leads in perfectly to um, JJ to respond to do people trust AI? And as you respond to this one, I want you to frame it, if you can, in around what's happening with, the, say, the COVID vaccine. I know it's not the same, but what happens when people have this element of doubt or trust in either treatment or intervention as such? What a good analogy. So the success of the vaccine program and the success of AI adoption relate to the same concept, and that is the correlation between trust and social acceptance. So how do you build social acceptance? In the case of AI, there are four very key elements that we need to focus on. The lawfulness of the tool so that it acts within the boundaries of privacy, security, and so on. The ethical framework and that the AI tool therefore respects the principles and values which are the norms of our society. And this type of implementation changes from country to country as the ethical norms change too. The third is this concept of robustness, that the technology which we offer needs to feel robust from a technical perspective, as well as from a social environment perspective. And, and that in turn creates reusability because it feels uh, like a robust service. And lastly is this concept of explainability, which Stefan just touched on very, very briefly now. The idea that the tool is understandable by the human patient and also the clinician who's um, you know, overlooking this process. The first one is th this is not an off-the-shelf product. This is something that we will continually work with each client in order to develop the virtual agent so that it is as contextually sensitive as possible to the uh, specific client cohort that there is or patient cohort that there is. And that is something that over time um, well, relatively quickly, within weeks, you start to improve both the recognition of the virtual agent and the contextual analysis of the questions being asked. We want to assure the success of the virtual agent. Too many projects in AI would actually fail because they're seen as an off-the-shelf kind of deployment 
and it's just left there and it does not reach the targets that it's meant to do. So um, that is an ongoing process. The other element is, if you like, the product development. Uh, we're talking about one of the most fastest move moving areas of technology that there is. So we are constantly analyzing the features and the functions which are available and whether they can support better outcomes for the virtual agents, then we try to in, imbue the, the, the product with those features as soon as possible. It's an ongoing process and we certainly can't stand still. Sometimes we feel even when we sprint. Uh, when we <laughs> So it's very much that kind of game. Uh, for my message is about um, supported self-management. So uh, one of the large NHS long-term mantras has been introducing supported self-management or SSM, which is this idea that we can create personalized care as a business as usual function within the healthcare system. But for me, supported self-management basically means two things, choice and control. I think AI and computer technology today gives us the capability to offer choice and control to patients in a way that was never available before. Bidirectional conversations which are intelligent, which are deep, which are interoperable with the past, which are secure, and which are exposed onto messaging channels, which today are part of the cultural fabric of our nature, of our nation. And this really allows us to build on what matters, which is secure data and safe clinical outcomes. I always think before we deploy a, a solution, I always think, do you have a problem that you're trying to solve? Don't just jump into AI because you think that it might be quite a cool word. And, and innovation, and it's not, innovation is not just about technology, it's actually about new ways of thinking and working. And lastly, always put the patient first, make sure they're the center of everything you do. What I would like to mention is this is all about, in the end, simplicity and bringing as simple a solution as possible to the people who need it the most. Um, when we talk about AI, when we talk about all the various features that there are, we, we can sometimes get um, burdened with the com sounding complexity that there is around it. But really, if you saw, when you see the demo, it is a very simple way of, ex of uh, exposing very usable functionality to people. And that simplicity must be kept at heart, I think, in these kind of projects. And uh, so you know, one of the most important things that I can think about all this is that we have to focus on value to the decision makers as digital transformation needs to support operational transformation. They can't happen in, um, independently. Oh, they, they can't happen in isolation. And last but not least, um, explain this value to patients so that the, so at the end of it all, you enable digital health for all. Thank you very much for that. And I hope you guys have been tuning in from beginning to end. There were so many excellent sound bites there. So much inspiration. AI is not coming to replace, it's coming to complement, supplement, and um, enable us to deliver better care for health consumers. Okay, so please get in touch with Ebo if your questions, they're, they're always ready to answer them. You need a demo. If you even want to be a guest speaker at, at one of these um, web events, reach out to Ello, who will be, be able to respond to you in a timely way. Email address is hello at ebo.ai. This has been Douglas Hammond, DJ, hosting, moderating on the behalf of Centric Health and Ebo. Thank you very much for tuning in. Be safe.